In the 21st century, nothing is more dangerous than ignorance, and the most dangerous kind of ignorance is ignorance of Islam. Islam has a lot to say about various groups — Christians, Jews, polytheists, women, and so on — and it's important for these groups to understand what Islam says about them, because what Islam says about them will have an ever-increasing impact on their communities as Islam spreads. The Quran contains numerous references to Jews, and the Quran's claims about Jews have been affecting Jewish-Muslim relations for nearly 14 centuries. For Jewish viewers who would like to know what Islam says about them but don't have much time to study the Muslim sources, I've put together the shortest possible list of relevant Quran verses. There are dozens of Quran verses about Jews that we could examine, but we're going to focus on just three, all from the same chapter, Surah 5. The first verse is Surah 5, verse 32. Chances are, even if you've never studied Islam, you've heard part of this verse at some point, because it's the most commonly quoted Quran verse in the West, especially after terrorist attacks. When jihadis slaughter unbelievers in the name of Allah, we're told that such attacks are un-Islamic, because the Quran declares that if anyone kills a man, it's as if he's killed all mankind. This is supposedly what Surah 5, verse 32 of the Quran says. Watch what happens when we read the entire verse. Because of that we ordained for the children of Israel that if anyone killed a person not in retaliation of murder or to spread mischief in the land, it would be as if he killed all mankind. And if anyone saved a life, it would be as if he saved the life of all mankind. And indeed, there came to them our messengers with clear proofs, evidences, and signs. Even then, after that, many of them continued to exceed the limits, e.g. by doing oppression unjustly and exceeding beyond the limits set by Allah by committing the major sins in the land. Notice four things about this verse. One, the Quran says that this was a revelation for the Jews. We ordained for the children of Israel that if anyone killed a person not in retaliation of murder or to spread mischief in the land, it would be as if he killed all mankind. And we know what the Quran is referring to here. This is a quotation from the Talmud, Mishnah Sanhedrin. The next verse, Surah 5, verse 33, is a revelation for Muslims, and it commands Muslims to dismember and crucify all kinds of people. Two, since this is the standard verse quoted by Muslims to show that Islam is a religion of peace, we should always point out that the most peaceful verse in the Quran is actually a quotation from the Talmud. Three, the Quran says that this Jewish teaching is a revelation from Allah. So according to the Quran, the Talmud, or at least a portion of it, is a revelation from Allah, just as the Torah and the Gospel, according to the Quran, are revelations from Allah. Four, the Quran says that there was an exception to the rule against killing and that Jews could execute people for spreading mischief in the land. If anyone killed a person not in retaliation of murder or to spread mischief in the land, it would be as if he killed all mankind. So Jews, according to the Quran, had authority from Allah to carry out capital punishment for certain crimes committed in the land. Pop quiz for those of you who read the Quran. Which land is the Quran referring to here? Is it A, Canada, B, China, C, Switzerland, or D, Israel? Allah, according to the Quran, gave the children of Israel authority over the land of Israel. Might be good to know that in case it comes up in conversation. Next verse, Surah 5, verse 43. The historical background of this verse is that some Jews came to Muhammad to judge a dispute. Allah responds by saying to Muhammad, But how do they come to you, O Muhammad, for decision while they have the Torah, the Torah, in which is the plain decision of Allah? Yet even after that they turn away, for they are not really believers. Allah wants to know why Jews would come to Muhammad when they already had the Torah. Muhammad gives a dramatic illustration of Allah's point in Sunan Abu Dawud. 4449, where we see Muhammad's reaction to the Jews coming to him for judgment. In 7th century Arabia, the person who judged a dispute would sit on a judgment cushion. Watch what Muhammad does. They set out a cushion for the Messenger of Allah, and he sat on it. 
Then he said, Bring me the Torah. It was brought. And he took the cushion from beneath him and placed the Torah on it and said, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you. So the Jews bring the Torah. Muhammad speaks to it and says, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you. Then Muhammad takes the judgment cushion out from under him and puts the Torah on the judgment cushion. According to the Quran, do Jews need Muhammad's revelations? No, because they already have the Torah. The Quran, then, is completely useless to Jews. Notice also that contrary to Muslim claims that the Bible has been corrupted, both Muhammad and Allah affirm the inspiration, preservation, and authority of the Torah. Third verse, Surah 5, verse 82. Verily, you will find the strongest among men in enmity to the believers, i.e. Muslims, the Jews and those who are al-mushrikun. Mushrikun are idolaters. And you will find the nearest in love to the believers, i.e. Muslims, those who say, we are Christians. That is because amongst them are priests and monks, and they are not proud. So, the greatest enemies of Muslims are Jews and idolaters, and the closest in love to Muslims are Christians. It's interesting how Allah's eternal word, the Quran, changed depending on how Muhammad was feeling. When Muhammad began receiving revelations in Mecca, the message of the Quran was, it's Muslims, Jews, and Christians united as monotheists against the polytheists. Later, Muhammad and his followers moved to Medina, and the Jews rejected him as a prophet. That's when the message of the Quran changed to, Muslims and Christians are united against pagans and Jews. Eventually, Christians also rejected him as a prophet, so the message of Islam became, it's Muslims against everyone. Surah 5 verse 82 is obviously from the middle period, when there was still hope that Christians would accept Muhammad. Odd that an eternal book would be so heavily influenced by Muhammad's interactions with non-Muslims. But the Quran's claim that Jews are among the greatest enemies of Islam has had a lasting impact on Muslims and even on their view of future events. In Sahih Muslim, number 7339, Muhammad says, The hour, the day of judgment, will not begin until the Muslims fight the Jews and the Muslims will kill them, until a Jew hides behind a rock or a tree, and the rock or tree will say, O Muslim, O slave of Allah, there is a Jew behind me. Come and kill him. Putting all of this together, the Quran says that Jews were given not only revelations from Allah, including the Torah and the Talmud, but also a piece of land where Jews could enforce their laws against those who make mischief. The Quran says that Jews don't need Muhammad because they have the Torah, the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of Allah. But for some reason, even though Muhammad and the Quran are useless to Jews, they're still supposed to acknowledge Muhammad as a prophet. Since they don't, and since they turn away from their own revelations, Jews are the enemies of Muslims until Muslims kill them to usher in the end times. Not very comforting, but that's what we find when we read the Muslim sources. Now, if I were a Jew, I would spend quite a bit of time responding to what the Quran says about me, and my family, and my community. And if anyone asked me, why do you spend so much time criticizing the Quran, I would calmly reply, the Quran talked about me, and my family, and my community, long before I said a word about the Quran. And if you don't think that I have every right to respond to Islam's most trusted sources calling for our violent subjugation, then you're promoting a legal system known as Sharia.